Hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace, Double CCA and Cisco Press author. And in this video, I want to get you started working with the Cisco CSR, the Cloud Services Router 1000V. And the V reminds us that it's a virtual router. I've been working with this a lot lately because the CSR 1000V, that's what's on the new CCA Collaboration Lab version 2.0. And as I've been working with this, it occurred to me that, you know what? This would be a fantastic solution for somebody wanting to lab up some route scenarios. You're working with RIP NG perhaps, or OSPF or EIGRP or BGP. You want to play with route redistribution. Maybe you want to set up a Cisco iOS firewall. You can do all those sorts of things on a CSR 1000V and, and you can do it for free assuming that you've got the hardware to run ESXi on. So that's what we're going to do in this video. Now, here's the disclaimer. I realize that the CSR 1000V is capable of a lot more than we're going to see in this video. You could do all sorts of cool little tweaks and you can set up trunks and you can set up these uh, console connections by doing some firewall manipulation. I just want to get you started. Our goal for this video is to set up a three router lab that you could use to do just about any route scenario that you would want to. So let's go out to the live interface right now and take a look at some characteristics of the CSR 1000V. Cisco's Cloud Services Router, as we mentioned, is a virtual router, which means that we can run it in a virtual machine along with lots of other routers on that same underlying hardware, or we could host it out in a cloud provider. For example, I'm going to be demonstrating this on VMware ESXi. Specifically, I'm going to be using version 6.7, but you could run it on Microsoft Hyper-V. You could run it in the cloud on AWS, and this is just a sampling. There are other platforms as well that are supported. You can check the documentation out at Cisco website for all of the platforms, but these are some of the big players that we think about. And it's going to be running Cisco iOS XE. And the great news is this is very similar to regular Cisco iOS that you would have on something like an ISR second generation router. That means that if you're studying for your CCNA and routing and switching, or maybe your route exam, or you're doing some T-shoot troubleshooting exercises, this could be a fantastic solution for you. I mentioned a few moments ago that I started working with the CSR 1000V because that's what Cisco is using on their new CCA Collaboration Lab version 2.0 of the lab. And I think this is great for home lab use, not just for collaboration, but also for, like I said, route switch, your route exam, maybe T-shoot. And to get started, we need to go out and download the software. And the software that you're going to be able to download is going to vary based on what your level of permission is associated with your Cisco CCO account. Now, I used to be associated with a Cisco Learning Partners account, which meant I could go out and download just about anything I wanted. However, now, since I have my own company, I'm a little bit more limited on what I can download. So I'm not able to go out and download for free the 16.3 version of CSR 1000V. However, Cisco does make available, and I think this is available to anybody that has a free CCO account, they make available version 13.11.2 SED, and that's still running some version of iOS 15, so it's not like it's outdated by a whole lot. But if you don't have a SmartNet maintenance contract, this might be the only one that you can download for free, but you can go out and see what you're able to download. And just to make it easy to find this page, I've created a short bit.ly link. You can go to bit.ly slash CSR1000V. And when you get there, you're going to be presented with a page like you see here on screen, and you're asked, do you want to download the OVA file? the bin or the ISO file. And normally I would pick the OVA file because that has all the information that something like ESXi needs to create the virtual machine. It knows how much hard drive space and how much RAM and it knows the network interface cards. But I had an issue when trying to load this on version 6.7 of ESXi. Now earlier I tried to load it on, I think it was ESXi 5.5 and the OVA worked fine. So it just depends on what version of ESXi you're running. You might be fine with the OVA, but if it doesn't work, I want to show you in this video how to use the ISO file. Now I've downloaded that ISO file to my hard drive. So you just go out and log in with your Cisco account using that link. Select the ISO image if you want to follow along with this video. And we'll hop out in just a moment to the ESXi interface and I'll show you how we upload that ISO file from the hard drive and then how we build a sample topology. Now, by the way, this video is assuming that you already have or know how to set up ESXi. And if you don't, if you don't have ESXi installed already or you're not familiar with it, I'm going to be doing another video coming up in a bit 
That's going to show you how to install ESXi because it's needed not just for CSR 1000V, it's needed for lots of virtual things that Cisco has. For example, I'm going to be working with the 12.0 version of a Communications Manager and a lot of the other servers that Cisco has. And those are going to be running on my VMware ESXi machines. So I'll do another video showing how to get that set up. But this is assuming that we've already got ESXi set up. Here's the topology we want to build. And again, this is targeting somebody that wants to practice with routing technologies, routing protocols, route redistribution, maybe different areas within OSPF, route filtering. I want to show you how to set up three routers, R1, R2, and R3. Now, ESXi comes with one virtual switch. It's called vSwitch0. And this is connected to an external interface, which connects out to my lab network. And it has an address space of 192.168.1.0/24. I'm going to give in that final octet R1 a value of 15. So that's going to point out to my lab network. But then notice that R1 needs to connect to R2. So I'm going to create a virtual switch. I'll call it SW1V that sits between R1 and R2. I'll create another virtual switch, SW2V, that sits between R2 and R3. And I'll create a third virtual switch, SW3V, that hangs off of R3. Now, please keep in mind, I wouldn't have to create all these virtual switches. I could just create multiple port groups on the vSwitch0, much like you would create different VLANs on a Cisco Catalyst switch, and I could connect everything there. But I thought, and I went back and forth on this a little bit, but I thought it's going to be easier to visualize if we use a topology like this, because we can visualize a router connecting to a switch, connecting to a router, to a switch, and so on. So this is the topology that I want to build for you. Now, let's get started by going out to the ESXi interface. Here we are inside of the ESXi web interface. And in previous versions of ESXi, you might have had to download a utility that runs on Microsoft Windows that gets you this kind of interface. But here, I'm running version 6.7. I can access it over the web. And this is a fresh install. I don't have any virtual machines created. I don't have any additional virtual switches or port groups created. We just want to start from scratch. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to upload that ISO file that I've already downloaded from Cisco. To do that, I go into Data Store 1, and I want to go to the Data Store browser. Let's find that file. I'll do an upload, and here it is, CSR1000V. Let's open that up, and it's going to upload that to my Data Store. And then I'll point to this ISO image as I'm installing my three virtual machines, which are going to be my three virtual routers. Give it just a few more seconds to finish the upload. Well, it looks like we're uploaded. There's our file. We'll come back to that later. Let's close out of that. And the first thing I want to do is to create our three virtual switches. So let's go to networking, virtual switches, and you can see the one that we get by default to be switch zero, but I'm going to say add a standard virtual switch. I'll make this font a bit bigger so it'll be easier to see. Let's add a standard virtual switch. I'm going to call this one SW1V to remind me it's a virtual switch. And the VM NIC 0 is already in use by vSwitch 0. And my server has three other NICs in it. I'm not going to use those NICs, so it doesn't really matter what I choose here. I'll just leave it at VM NIC 1, which is in the down state because I don't have anything connected but I have to select something, and I'll say Add. So I've created another switch. Let's create another switch, SW2V. SW2V. We'll add that. And one other switch. We'll say this is SW3V, and we'll add that. Now what we want to do is to create a port group, which is going to represent the ports on these different switches. I'll create PG1. Port group 1, in other words, for switch SW1V. I'll create PG2, port group 2, for our second switch, and PG3 for our third switch. And the vSwitch0 switch that we have by default, it also has a default port group. Let me show you. If I go to port groups, you see this one that says VM network? That's what's assigned to the ports on that vSwitch0. And again, I could assign different port groups to the same switch, much like we would have different VLANs on a Cisco Catalyst switch, but I'm trying to make it easy to visualize, so I'm going to create a different port group for each switch. I'll say Add Port Group, and I'll call this one PG1, Port Group 1. I'll not worry about the VLAN because I'm consuming all the ports on the switch with this port group, and it's going to be associated with switch SW1V. So Port Group 1, PG1, that goes with SW1V. We'll add that, 
let's add a second port group. You guessed it, it's called PG2, and it's going to be associated with Switch 2V. We'll add that. Let's create a third port group, PG3, and it's associated with SW3V. We've now added our switches, we've added our port groups. We are now ready to install those routers, those CSR1000Vs. So I'm going to go to Virtual Machines, and I don't have any right now, so I'm going to say Create, Register, VM. And again, I'm not using the OVA file here because there was a compatibility issue with that version of CSR1000V and my version of ESXi, which is 6.7. So I want to say Create a New Virtual Machine, I'll say Next. I'll give it a name of R1. And for compatibility reasons, I don't want to select ESXi 6.7. Now, your mileage is going to vary if you're using a different version of the CSR1000V. I'm showing you what's compatible with that free version that you can download. If you're able to download one of those 16.x versions, yeah, you might be fine with another version of ESXi. But I'm going to say I want to be compatible with ESXi 5.0 virtual machine. And maybe other combinations and permutations work as well, but I did some experimentation and this is what I found works. So I'm going to stick with that. And I'll say the guest operating system is Linux and the specific flavor of Linux that I found would work is other 2.4 x Linux 64-bit. And we'll say next. I've only got one data store, so I'll select that as my data store. One CPU is fine. Memory needs to be 2.5 gig. So I'll change megabytes to gigabytes and put in 2.5. 8 gig hard drive is fine. Network adapter 1. I'll say I want to connect that to VM network. Let's add another network adapter. And I'll say I want to connect that to port group 1. So this is going to be sitting between my lab network, which connects into the port group named VM network, and router R2, which is also going to connect into port group PG1. And before we start configuring IP addresses on these routers, I'll confirm what interface is associated with which port group. Now for the CD, I want to boot off that ISO file. So instead of host device, I'm going to say data store ISO file. Let's select that ISO file. I'll say select. And we're done. I'll say next and finish. And let's get this machine started after it pops up here. I'll click on it. And the installation takes a while. Let's go ahead and close these notification boxes out. Let's go ahead and click on the power on button. And it'll give me a virtual console. What I like to do is to go under actions and say open this in a new tab. So this will be in a new tab we can check in with. And like I say, it's going to take several, several minutes to finish this. While we're working on this install, we'll just go back and install our other virtual machines. So let's go back. I'll close this one out. Let's go back to Virtual Machines, and I'll just quickly run through the other two. It'll be exactly what we did before. I'll say Create a New Machine. This is going to be called R2. We'll select ESXi 5.0 Virtual Machine, Linux, Other, Linux, version 2.4.x, 64-bit. That's our only data store. We're going to have one CPU. 2.5 gig of RAM, 8 gig hard drive. One network adapter is going to be connected to port group 1. I want to have another network adapter that's connected to port group 2. And we're going to boot off our data store ISO file, which is this one. We'll select it. And we'll say Next. And Finish. And once it pops up, we'll start it and then go install our other virtual machine. So let's click on R2. We'll say power on. And once it pops up, I'll put it in a separate tab as well. I'll say actions, open console in new tab. So now let's see what's going on. Here's the R1 install going on. Here's R2 getting started. Let's go create R3. So back to virtual machines one more time. I'll close out this console window. And we'll say create, register, new virtual machine. So one final time. This one is going to be called R3, ESXi 5.0 Virtual Machine, Linux, Other 2.4.x, Linux 64-bit, that's our data store, one CPU, 2.5 gigabytes of memory, 8 gig of hard drive space, one network adapter is going to connect to port group 2, 
Let's add another network adapter that's going to connect to port group 3. And we want to boot off our data store ISO file. And that looks great. We'll say next and finish. And once it pops up, we'll start it so it can begin the installation. Let's power that on. And I'll say that I want to open this in another tab. So now we've got tabs for each of our routers. And I'm going to enlarge this just a bit to make it a little bit easier to view. And we still don't even have R1 installed yet. We don't have to do anything. It's a non-interactive installation. The first prompt we're going to see where we have to respond to anything is just like when you turn on a brand new router and it's asking, do you want to go through the setup wizard? And I'm going to say no to that. But I don't want to have to have the video running and you having to watch the entire installation screen. So I'm just going to pause the video here and we'll be back in a moment when it's prompting us whether or not we want to go through that setup script. After waiting several more minutes, we were finally presented with this prompt asking us if we want to enter the initial configuration dialog. This is that setup wizard I was talking about. I want to say no to this. We'll give it a moment to come back with a prompt. And then we're going to set this up much like we would set up any other Cisco router. We'll say enable. And right now I'm connected via a console connection through VMware ESXi. And a couple of things I want to do to that line so it doesn't time out on me and so I don't get all that word wrapping like I'm getting right now. I'm going to go in to global config. I'll go into line console zero. And I'll say logging synchronous, so I don't have that line wrapping issue that I'm having now. And I'll say exec timeout zero space zero, so it's not going to timeout on me. Something else I like to do in global configuration mode is to say no IP domain hyphen lookup. That way, if I type in something that's not correct, instead of Cisco IOS XE interpreting that as some sort of a, a DNS name it tries to resolve, I'll say no, don't do any domain lookup. And let's set the host name. This is going to be R1. And before I do any configuration with IP addresses, I want to go back to my VMware ESXi console and just confirm what interfaces are connected to R1. So let's go back to R1. Let's scroll down just a bit. And let's see, Network Adapter 1 is connected to PG1. Network Adapter 2 is connected to my VM network. Okay, so this Network Adapter 2, it's going to be my second interface. It's connected to my lab network. And by the way, this can get really tricky because you might have noticed when I initially set this up, I let the default Network Adapter be connected to the VM network, and then I added a Network Adapter, and I connected it to PG1. So you might have assumed, as I did originally, that that second adapter would be Network Adapter 2, when in reality it became Network Adapter 1. So careful with that. Always want to double check. So let's go assign these IP addresses. I'll go to R1, and let's do a do show IP interface brief, just to see what the interface names are. I've got two interfaces, Gigabit Ethernet 1, Gigabit Ethernet 2, and I know that Gigabit Ethernet 1 is actually connected, as we see right here, to my port group 1, to the 172.16.1.0/24 network. So let's go into interface Gigabit 1, and I'll say IP address 172.16.1.2 with a 24-bit subnet mask. Let's administratively bring it up with a no shutdown command. Let's go into interface gigabit 2, and I'll say its IP address is 192.168.1.15 with a 24-bit subnet mask. And let's administratively bring it up. And I'm just going to run OSPF. We'll just have one area and everybody's going to run OSPF. I'll create an OSPF process ID of one. And just to encompass all the interfaces on this router, I'll just say network 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 with a wildcard mask of all 255s. And I'll say area 0. And we are done. I'm going to do a, a write. You can do a copy run star. And that's going to make this available after I shut this down and bring it back up. It's going to remember my configuration. Let's go do a very similar thing on router R2. Let's say, no, I don't want to enter the configuration dialog. And while it's settling down, let's go back to our console. 
and see what interfaces are connected to which port groups. It looks like network adapter 1 is connected to port group 2. Okay, That's the 10.1.1.0-24 network. Network adapter 2 is connected to PG1. OK, great. Let's go set all that up. First of all, I'll go into enable mode. Then I'll do a config term, line con 0 to get rid of that really annoying word wrap issue. I'll say logging synchronous exec timeout 0 space 0. No IP domain. Look up. We'll set the host name to R2. And I'll go into interface gigabit 1. And that's going to be connected to the 10.1.1.0/24 network. So I'll assign the IP address of 10.1.1.1 with a 24-bit subnet mask. Administratively bring it up. Let's go into interface gigabit 2. And its IP address is going to be 172.16.1.1 with a 24-bit subnet mask. Administratively bring it up. Let's start an OSPF writing process here. By the way, these are locally significant process IDs. The, the ones that I put on these different routers, they did not have to match. I'm just doing it to pick a number. But I'll say network 0.0.0.0 .0 with a wildcard mask of all 255s. Everybody belongs to area 0. And in just a moment, if things worked well, we should have an OSPF adjacency come up between routers R1 and R2. In fact, it looks like that just happened. Let's do a show IP OSPF neighbor. Do I have a neighbor? Yes, I do. Excellent. Things are working good so far. Now let's go to, oh, let's go ahead and save this. I'll do a copy run star. And let's go to R3. And I'll say, no, I do not want to enter the configuration dialog. And let's go confirm what interfaces are connected to what port groups on R3. Looks like network adapter 1 is connected to port group 3. That's 10.1.2.0 slash 24. Network adapter 2, that'll be gig 2. That's connected to 10.1.1.0 slash 24. Great. Let's go back to R3. Enable. Global config. Let's go into line con 0. Logging synchronous. And then we'll say exec timeout, 0 space 0, no IP domain lookup, set the host name to R3. Let's go into interface gigabit 1. It's going to have an IP address of 10.1.2.1 with a 24-bit subnet mask. No shutdown. Interface gigabit 2. IP address is... 10.1.1.2 with a 24-bit subnet mask. Administratively bring it up. Let's create a routing process again. And I'll say network 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0. 0.0.0.0.255.255.255.0. Everybody belongs to area 0. Oh, and I gave an incorrect network statement there. I oh, should have put a 255 right there. There we go. Now, in just a moment, we should have an OSPF adjacency come up. I'll give it just a moment for that to happen. Looks like we are up. Let's see if I now know all the networks from R3. Let's do a show IP route. And look at this. I have learned a couple of networks via OSPF. I've learned the 192.168.1.0/24 network. I've learned the 172.16.1.0 network. I've learned all that via OSPF. Can I ping the far end of this network? Can I ping 192.168.1.15? That's my lab facing interface on R1. I sure can. So I've got full connectivity throughout my lab network. And this was a free way, and I say free, that's assuming that we have hardware to install VMware ESXi on. But if we do, this was a free lab that's running real Cisco IOS that I was able to build. And with three routers, I could do a lot. But I'm not limited to three routers. If I've got plenty of capacity on my server that's running VMware, then I could have lots and lots of routers. You can lab up a CCIA route switch lab on this thing if you had enough capacity. And with the network interface cards I have on my server that's running these virtual routers, I could connect out to some real gear. So even though I'm not doing a switch here, I could connect out to actual Cisco Catalyst switches. So this is an inexpensive way to get started building a fairly robust lab using Cisco's CSR-1000V.